All right. I guess we are live. Yes. It looked like it was a little bit of a technical issue. I kept getting this continuous, wait a minute, end stream. I think, yep, we are on live. Okay. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy, happy holidays. I always give a moment for the machine, the AI to turn on. Because people need to know that we're here and we come on your sh on the box every Wednesday. Been blessed to be able to turn that power on each and every week and get ourselves, you know, where we need to be. Talking all that jazz and talking some crazy talk, and you know what it is. But before I start, I wanted to mention some things. Prayers seem to be reaching strong to Miss Kathy Brown and her family. She's been going through a lot. I speak to friends of hers and, and people that are dealing with her directly, and they're telling us that she's pushing and looking, trying to come back. So some prayers are getting through. So keep those prayers on high. Second, don't let the stress, don't let the stress of the holidays get to you. A lot of people let that become more about the almighty dollar than the actual holiday of the decompression and the ending of the year. Please, by all means, reach out to friends and family that maybe you haven't reached out to because the holidays has a tendency to bring out depression. And why do I say that? Because what happens with the year end is you always look about what you don't have or what you didn't do or who's no longer with us. So you have to enjoy what you do have. Be grateful for what's around you, friends, family people that care for you, you know, and all that good stuff, try to, you know, always never lose that peace. That's an important part. And the reason why I'm saying this is because all of us seem to suffer with some sort of little depression around the holidays. As much as it's joyous and much as it's happiness and it's about the kids and about Christmas, Kwanzaa, you know, Hanukkah, whatever you celebrate, you know, it's always a remembrance of what sometimes you feel like what you're missing out on. Don't be fooled by the social media. You know, keep everything in perspective. Look at it from a different vision. Don't always look at it like, you know, oh, man, they're doing this. And, Yo, what am I not doing that? It is what it is. You know, just you just have to embrace what you have. Be grateful for what you have. And I'm the worst at that. Sometimes I'm like, I want more. I want this. I want that. But take a minute, take a deep breath, pause, look around you, appreciate also what you do have. And most importantly, health is wealth. Enough of my public service message. Welcome to True House Stories. I'm Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City. And today we got a special special fella coming on that we revere. It's one of our soldiers in the dance world of house music. He's been doing this for decades and still going strong, keeping it real. And we were just talking on camera. It's funny because how real he's always, one thing I could say about this man, he's always been real. <laughs> real when I met him 30 years ago and real today. Okay. He's a talented writer, talented producer. The records speak for themselves. He's also an excellent singer. Not that he will ever say I'm the singer singer, but he is excellent at that as well. You know, he you know how some people struggle to write records? This man doesn't struggle at all. This just happens. He just has to be in the right frame of mind, the right mood. You know? Um, he comes from good stock. He was trained by some of the best guys in the game. And when he stepped in, it wasn't about making house records. For him, it was about making real songs, songs that would test time. 
And I mean that. That would hold their weight. You know, when I look back at, you know, All Right by Urban Soul and those records, Flowers and all the classics that he did, South Street Player, and now, and now he's stepped into the tech, techy side of the business, more electronic side, because he felt there was a step forward that needed to be done, a change. And he's going to explain all that to you. Um, we talked about, you know, there's a classic guy that we know, and there's also the guy that is now cutting edge and doing what he does. And he's out there DJing, he's making trouble <laughs> with his posts and making you all talk about maybe he's got comes up with an idea and makes you all think for a minute. And that's what makes him brilliant at what he does. And when he writes his songs, he uses that same way. It makes you think about the words he's saying. You know, you don't just all this, you know, it's not like mindless music, as we would say. But enough of that, enough of me. I like to bring up this brother man to this wonderful place called True House Stories, Mr. Roland Clark. What up, my brother? First and foremost, you're definitely reading my eulogy at my funeral, Lenny. Like, <laughs> you're definitely going to be reading my, at least one of the people. Like, all right, next to the stage. Lenny Fontana is going to say Lenny something. Fontana. Really He's going to say something. <laughs> that was a good introduction. I was laughing. I was like, that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. What's up, Lenny? How you doing, bro? I'm good. We want to let everybody know how you have been through everything. Beginning from what date? You know, I don't you gotta... know. All right, let's start. Let's start. <laughs> let's leave it up from COVID. Like, pick up from there. When COVID ended, <sighs> how you been doing? COVID ended. I was, um, I moved here to this wonderful town. And um, I just started working. I, the, well, the best thing about COVID was I did so, I got more work than I've ever had in my life because everybody was home trying to get that next record. You know what I mean? So imagine making a ton of money, but you can't go to the store to go get gum. You know, <laughs> it's like, I want some gum. You can't. Like, fuck, I got 40,000 bucks and I can't buy gum. I can't nope. do anything. I can't do anything. <laughs> I used to sneak to the beach, though. I used to get in my car and go, look, if I get arrested, I get arrested. It's November. It's freezing outside in New Jersey at the time I was at. And I, I would go to the beach with all these clothes on and my hoodie and just look out into the water. Like, that was like, I looked like a postcard. It was weird, dude. But um, It did feel what... surreal, didn't it? Remember how it felt strange, like you're out on the beach and stuff, like you were the only one there? I kind of like it like that. But you like, know what Jesus. I mean? It felt like the I end know. of the world. It felt like the end of the world, like something was wrong. Dude, if we were going to die, I don't want to die by myself. I want to die with 20 million people. Like, I want to go to heaven like, yay! You know, <laughs> I, I want everybody to come with me, you know? So I don't know. All right. So All right. COVID, back to the question. Because I'll take it somewhere else. Um, I don't know. I just did a lot of work and I uh, concentrated on whatever next moves I was going to try to make and um, in this industry. And yeah. replan out and replan out your, your life path. Did it make you think about, you know, just a strategy. Um, but all my life, things have kind of happened for me, regardless of what I wanted it to happen or not. And it's good things, you know, like I'm very blessed on things, you know, like um, a guy named Duke Dumont, uh, reached out to me and said, "Hey, I sampled the song of yours." And I was like, "Oh, thanks. Which one?" Wonderful. That's a wonderful. And he goes, he goes, this song called "What the Fuck." I was like, "All right, cool, thanks." Yeah. And it ended up on it ended up on Katy Perry's record, her number, her hit single, a song called "Switch Switch." So that's when I was like, "Oh, wow, that's that's pretty deep." But this, so I got to relate. But people who don't understand what you mean, you know, because we got people who are not DJs, they're just people, laymen. When they mm -hmm. mean sample, what exactly does that mean to someone? So, so when you put out a record and there's like a vocal or a sample or a kick, um, somebody would take that and add it onto their record and make it a part of their record for a fee, you know. And, you know, Duke Dumont sampled, put a part of my record onto this Katy Perry record and therefore made it a very good thing to, to happen. I bet. <laughs> Monetarily and uh, publicity wise, you know. And I got a relationship with him. Like we're really, we're cool. We're very cool people. You know, cool. Dude, 
and that's not you know that's not your only like sink you've got well no stuff. oh i got tons of stuff but he was like the beginning of of all of, of me going yeah i think i might want to do more tech house and techno and, and all different types of genres as much as i love sofa house it just felt like i've I, i've kind of wore out my welcome <laughs> or it just came to a, a, a point where it's like okay you know let me go this way now you know what i mean like i never wanted to be monolithic i never wanted to stay in the same room i mean imagine going to a club with 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 20 rooms and you just stay in one you know you want to go to all the different rooms in the club and see what's happening so that's how i looked at my career i was like i want to go to a different room now and see if not if i can do it but see if i can do it and do it to a point where the people who are doing it well look at me and goes hey you're doing great you know that little pat on the back you know yeah, I mean, because I guess, you know what, when you do something for so long, it can become mundane, it can become unchallenging, and it also can become very complacent. So it is good to step outside. And and, and the door opened for you in a funny way. Duke Dumont is a good door to open. It's not like somebody who's a nobody came to you knocking. Mm. Oh, dude, it was weird. Like, after it's Duke, things just happened. Like, I, one day I'm... You know, I'm on Instagram a lot looking at the girls because my algorithm just sends me naked girls. Don't know why. And uh, I'm looking and saying like, 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 and then I get a, 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 an email or a DM from this guy named uh, Ventures Culture. I didn't know who he was. I knew he had a lot of followers. And he goes, hey, man, you know, I would like for you to cut a vocal on, on this track. I said, well, let me hear the track first. I heard the track. And this is right after COVID. Everybody was going back to the clubs. And he said, oh, I want something about like how things are open up again I was like say less I got you so I wrote this vocal call free and it, it's the, I'm not gonna lie the vocal was so good I was thinking about not giving it to him <laughs> I was like this is too good but I was like all right you know he already paid me here you go and the record just blew up like boom it was a perfect we're, we're free again no more COVID song right it was just a huge record so the song was called free so after that kind of died down, you know, I played at Brooklyn Mirage with him uh, because of that record. That was a good thing, good look. But after that record died down, I said, well, you know, I need to do another song that to kind of like back that up because you can't just go here and then, you know what I mean? So I wrote a song called um, Alive, right? So I was like, you know, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. Like, you know, we survived, I'm alive. One of those things. And um, I sent it to these guys who helped do the track for free called Fancy Ink. They live out in Brazil. They was, I was like, hey, you know, check this track out. I said, can we remix it? I was like, yeah, sure, you know, go for it. So not only did they remix it, they remixed it and sent it to their manager. And I think their manager um, sent it to David Guetta's manager. <laughs> and David Guetta goes, I want to be a part of this project. So that was surreal. I was like, wait, wait a minute, you know, three in a row, you know, so I was like, cool. So he became part of the project as Black Jack Black, which was like, okay, whatever. So that record did well. And then he goes, I want to do the same song, but I want to do it under my name now. So now I officially have a record with David Guetta. I was like, wow, you know. So what you expect something to happen and what actually happens are two different things, right? So the excitement okay, so wait, of- so, Wait, so what are you expecting? Oh, dude, I, I expected my life to change. Like, oh. <laughs> Champagne, going, caviar, dreams, the whole deal, I'm, right? I'm going Bentley shopping, you know. So, but the reality of the music industry is you can have a great record with a great person, but, it, you know, it, it'll move a meter to a point where um, you have to have a team behind you. There's a lot of things that have to happen before something actually changes. So the good thing that happened was I got to meet David Gatter, right? Okay. Um, the record came out. The record did okay. It was more of a, 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 a um, it was your regular type of David Getter record. It was more like rave meets techno. That's the only way I can describe it. So it didn't hit the charts the way um, I thought it would hit the charts. And I was like, okay, whatever. So we did another record, I think the next year, um, called A Walk to Church. That was more like a housey, a church house record, which is totally out of character for, you know, I thought David Getter, okay, whatever. Um, I did some stuff with Armin Van Buren. Um, two things with him actually. Um, so here I am working with all these A-list guys and I'm like, wow, you know, things are going to change. <laughs> and the only thing that changed was I did some stuff with some A-list guys. So the music industry is, is, is very linear. It's like, 
you have to you have to be the change you something something and something outside of you can't change anything for you you have to go i'm going to change you know i i forgot to change so now i'm just doing things for me you know what i mean like i, I want to write a song for me like that's the change i'm making right now like i'm writing songs for me not for a label not to see if a label would like it not to see if it can get on any an a-list guys you know thing it's for me and i think that's where the energy lies within all of us it's, it's the energy lies within and I, I know that sounds like some kind of no it's true no you're right no no you're right. if you don't make that change mm -hmm. it's not gonna nothing around you is gonna change nothing around you're gonna change you know so you're right so that's where i'm at right now i'm, I'm just kind of i'm on my third song that i wrote for me not for um to see if the label likes it not to see if somebody's gonna like it i have to like it you know do you also blame social media as a problem for that because back in the day you would have had if you would have done something like that with a-listers back when the record companies were back where like say when merlin bob was atlanta that whole structure mm -hmm. old horocracy if well you, imagine yeah you know, I, if you, I, you know what i'm saying if you'd have been able imagine to Imagine if you have a hundred people to 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 show something to. More than likely, twenty people might hear it. Fifty people might now. Fifty people might hear it. Twenty people might like it. Ten people might consider putting it out. Five people, you know. So you take that one hundred number and you make it, you know, one hundred million. Right. You know. It's the difference now, right? Make it's it's, it's it's a lot of fish in the pond now. So I don't blame social media. It's actually. It's it's good if you know how to use it. I think the problem with people from my era is they don't know how to use it because they're so stuck in their ways of doing it their way. I hear I heard people complaining about oh, I'm in my city, man. These guys never put me down with gigs. I hate these guys. Like, well, why are you waiting for them to put you down with gigs? Start your own thing and start from scratch. You know, I think people think the world owes them something. And I used to think like that, like, oh, you know, the world owes me something. And it's like, well, no, it actually doesn't. <laughs> you know, you owe yourself something. So start your own thing. Start your own, you know, party. You know, start your own label. Start your own label. You know, Good point because there's a lot of 17, 18 year old guys that will that will kill to have anything and be there, and they'll do whatever they got to mm -hmm. do to get to be in that position. They're not looking at the world owes me anything. They just want to make it happen. Yeah. And that's what happens with that word complacent. You get mm -hmm. locked in your own box for a very long time. And you think everybody owes you. And what happens? Bitterness. Mm -hmm. uh, after, well, sh bitterness becomes anger. You become angry, man. Mm -hmm. And then after yeah. angry, man, you become retired, man. Because you ain't going to work for nobody. I was all of that. I was right? Mad. I was like, I got all these hit records and I'm not getting booked. I'm not blah, and da, da, da. And then one day I went, I'm gonna go for a ride. And I drove down to Miami from New York. And it was just a pleasant drive. I was listening to like Jim Croce and Bonavir on the radio. My, my windows were down. And I was like, this is happiness. You know, like I couldn't care less about all that stuff. So I changed my way of thinking over a, or a matter of time and just kind of, you know, like I said, when I see people do that stuff, I'm like, if you do it and you see how hard it is to get to where they came or where they what they become, you won't just let anybody in it in your camp either. You know, you you protect it, you know. So nobody really owes you anything. It'd be nice if people reached out to you and say, like, hey man, because you did this, we're gonna reward you. But the world doesn't work like that, especially nowadays. Back in the day, yeah, it was like great job. You know, some of our biggest and best DJs. The Curry Chandlers, um, who 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 transcended where he came from. You know what I mean? Um, Todd Terry transcended, you know, the beginning. I'm talking about the older guys who who are still here and and they're playing to like five, six thousand people a weekend. When I see that stuff, I'm like, wow, I'm proud of them, you know. So the newer guys, I can't say I'm more proud of them because I want to use the word they cheated they had the internet <laughs> you know we didn't have the internet well they had a, we, let's put it like they had a good head start a really good great head start. head start like i tell my son all the time i was like dude i wish i was born when you were born Whew. Whew. like if i had the internet what you know 
and we still don't use it the way we should use it. But um, it is what it is. All right, I, I can rant all day. So we got okay. Keep so going. let's get you to rant. Let's get you to rant from day one. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. So when rant. you were a young kid starting out in life, how did music find you? Or you? Oh, find dude. Music? Uh, Take us there's on that two, journey. There's two names I can I can um, say. It's Calvin Gaines. And Philip Damien, who's AKA Michael Moog, right? They were my next door neighbors in East Orange, New Jersey. And Calvin was playing a guitar with no shoes on, walking down the street one day, like an acoustic guitar. And I was like, who the hell is that guy? You know? And we met. He was like, he lived a couple of houses from me. Um, his brother was Michael Moog. He was the, the antagonist, you know, in the family. <laughs> And, uh, but Calvin taught me how to write lyrics. He took his time with me, taught me how to write lyrics. He taught me how to play bass. He just taught me the basics of music at the age of 15 and 16 years old. Not knowing this is what I was gonna be doing for the rest of my life. It was just something to do because you're bored, you're a teenager, you know? So um, at some point, and this is, in, in hindsight, when I look back at it, it's almost like destiny. So me and Calvin had these jobs as landscapers <laughs> <laughs> in Orange, New Jersey, and it was December, it was cold, and Calvin would disappear. Every day he would disappear, like, I'll be back. And he would give me 20 bucks to stay and do his job. I'm like, where's this guy going every day? And turns out he was going to New York, this recording studio called Calliope. And I was like, I want to go one day. So I just quit the job and started hanging out with Calvin. And that's where I met everybody. Like, you know, I met Merle and Bob, I met, you know, Audio 2 before they had a deal, um, Salt and Pepper before they had a deal, Stetson Sonic Wap when they got their deal, met all these huge rappers and sat in the sessions with like Winston Jones and Paul, uh, Paul Simon, not Paul Simon, Paul Simpson. I mean, I saw a whole bunch of people come through that studio and I go, I think I want to do what they do, you know? And I just started doing it. Like it was almost one of those things I didn't think twice about it. It was just like, this is what I do, you know? And I just said, this is what I do, you know? So because I said, this is what I do, I had to start doing it, you know? So Merle and Bob gave me my first opportunity to write a song and subsequently sing on the song and put it out. And it was just a weird, it was just a weird, in hindsight though, and at the time it was happening, it was like, oh, no big deal. But in hindsight, it's like, okay, I put out this record with Merle and Bob on Atlantic Records. It was all over the radio. Why? And I was like, oh, I'm gonna be rich. <laughs> I swear I was like 20, 21. And next thing you know, Merlin puts out another record two weeks later by this dude who I knew who played keyboards at this lounge in Orange, New Jersey. His name was CC Rogers. And the song was called Someday. And I was like, the song obliterated my song and just threw my song off the radio. So now Someday is this huge hit. And I'm happy for him. But then another record came out, Merlin signed, called Devotion, and just went boom, 10 City. So Roland Clark was just gone. Like that was that was my whole career. I was like, okay, this is over. I'm done. It's a wrap. It was fun while it lasted. You know, let me go back to doing what I do. Um, I think I'm just fast forwarding. We got jobs with this guy named Dick Scott in entertainment where he managed new kids on the block, and I was just doing that for like five years with those guys just kind of being in new york for the sake of being in new york and um something told me just just write another song just try to you know one more song and i wrote this song and i want to say it was 91 92 and i was embarrassed at this point to be roland clark i wanted to be somebody else so i named this group urban soul and i put out this record called all right and Chris's Cool Temple signed it. And I wasn't even excited about it because because of the last thing that happened to me. So the record came out and blew up all over Europe. I, I purposely didn't get excited. And I just kind of went, OK, whatever, you know. <laughs> and the song just kept blowing up. And then I went, wait a minute. You know, I got a second chance at this thing. So it did what it did. Next, you know, I'm like, OK, let me do more. Let me do more. And I, I did this record. And I'm. I'm fast forwarding two or three years later, you know, I want to say maybe 94. You probably know the date more than me. Um, I did this song called, um, no, I remember I was at the shelter. Whew, here it is. I was at the shelter and 
Timmy Register kept playing all these Tin City songs. And I was jealous. I was just like, wow, he never plays any of my records. <laughs> so I was like, He's I know what I'll do. Doing that. He's known for doing that, knowing you're there. He won't play it. He does that. Yes. I don't know. But I remember I was a, I was just dancing, having a good time. And one day I just, it just came and I'm going to write a song for Tin City. So this way he technically had to play my record. So I went home. I wrote this song. I was so excited because I loved the song. I took it up to Ten Cities A&R director. I'm not going to mention any names, Dave Shaw. And um, <laughs> A&R director, Dave Shaw. Yes. Yeah, he club. goes, not a good record for them. Basically, it's terrible. He probably remembered it another way. That's what I heard. So I was so depressed. I walked all the way down from Sony Music, went home. And where I lived in New York, I lived across the street from Strictly Rhythm. So I just kind of, it was like five or six o'clock in the afternoon. Everybody had left for the day except for George Morrell. So I'm sitting there complaining to George, oh, this is so unfair, you know, life sucks. You know, one of those things we always used to do. And um, George goes, what's wrong? I said, yeah, I wrote this song for Byron Stingley, man, but <sighs> they, they're not feeling it. He goes, let me hear it. So I played it for George. George goes, I'll be right back. He comes downstairs with this standard contract, which I didn't even read. I just knew like, you're gonna give me some money Great, signed the contract. Record comes out on Strictly Rhythm. South Street player. Who keeps changing your mind? Who keeps changing your the biggest record I ever had in my life because somebody turned it down. So that's when I started to realize, okay, the universe is kind of working for me because one guy said it sucked and, it, and this other guy signed it and it blew up. But that's so you know? usually what happens, brother. That's usually what mm -hmm. happens. People talk about that all the time. They get 20,000 no's mm -hmm. and then somebody grabs it on that feeling and then it's like, boom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but guys, think back then I was young. So this thing, this is all new to me. Um, the same thing Oh, happened. by the way, hang on. Mm -hmm. By the way, in that same building, Armand Van Helden lived in that same building too. Oh, and yeah. If I remember correctly, Armand I, was upstairs. They were all I, that, that, that guy. building. <laughs> that guy. Oh, that was weird. So no, well, let's tell that story. Michael, Michael Moon lived downstairs from me. Get a huge freaking loft, and I had a duplex penthouse, not to brag. And um, Moog left this, he left the loft, and he goes, Hey, my friend's gonna move in. I said, What's his name? He goes, Armand Van Helden. Never heard of him in my life. But the weird part about it was, I knew his ex girlfriend and I knew his kid. I used to babysit his son. I knew Armand Van Helden's son before I met him. Right? So when Armand moved in, he was just a, a nice, quiet guy, you know, real cool neighbor. And one day he knocks on my door and goes, um, hey, man, I got this loop. You know, Mook said you write songs. I said, yeah, all right. He goes, can you write something to this loop? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll get around to it. So six months later, Mook calls and goes, you know, did you ever write that thing for my, for Armand? I said, no. He's just do it and get it over with, man. And I was like, oh, fuck. And that I was, sounds I, like you. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to do it. I was it's like, shit, you. like, you know, all right, whatever. He's my neighbor. I can't duck him. He, we're in the same building. <laughs> Normally, I would just go, fuck that guy. <laughs> But I wrote this track and um, Flowers was born. It took like 30 minutes to write. Like that's how much I cared about it. It took 30 Six minutes to write. Six months of a tape sitting in your house and it's 30 flowers. minutes, thir just turn the thing on for 30 minutes, you write the song. Flowers, yeah. Yeah, it was weird, dude. Like my life was, it just, it almost like no matter how much I, I want to fuck it up, life goes, oh, okay, we'll fix it, you know. <laughs> we'll fix it for you. And um, yeah, that's just how things just kind of happened for me back in. And that's when I was like, somebody's watching watching out for me because I'm fucking up. <laughs> you know, like I'm, somebody's looking out for me. So, I mean, a lot of things just kind of started happening. You know, um, I, if I go song by song, it's just weird. Like, let's say Victor Cook, a song called Life Story. I don't know if you guys know it or not. Life um, Story. Yeah. So Victor Cook, <laughs> what, what's the song? What's that television show that Ed McMahon was? Um, Solid Gold? Uh, yeah, one of those things. <laughs> so Victor Cook was on that show. And Dick Scott started managing him, and he introduced us to Victor Cook. And um, Dick Scott goes, I want you boys to write a song for Victor Cook, me and Michael Moog. And I was like, yeah, yeah, cool, whatever. So, you know, we were, back then we were excited. If we had a real singer in the room, we were like, wow, they can really sing. That means we can do our best. So we wrote the song and I remember having the vinyl under my arm 
And uh, I took it down to the president of Motown Records at the time. His name was, um, I don't want to say any names, Timmy Register. Um, <laughs> I took it to his office. First of all, I'm telling this story too. Tell it. I took the record to his, his office. I said, yo, um, yeah. I said, yo, I want to, in that time, Shelter was like the club, right? I said, yo, check this record. I want to know if you can play it at the Shelter this Saturday. So the most annoying thing when you show an A&R record, a record, they listen to it, but they get up and they walk out the room or they get on the phone while your record's playing. That's annoying. And I was like, so he didn't really listen to it. He was just like, ugh. So that when the record was over, I said, what do you think? He goes, hey man, this record, you know, it's not, it's not for me, man. It's really not good at all. <laughs> he goes, this record is basically this record is garbage. You know, like, like I was emotional back then. I was like, damn, man, I kind of hurt my feelings, but whatever. So that night, that very night, um, I don't know if you remember the, the, the shelter used to open for industry stuff, like yes. some after work stuff. So Clark Kent was doing this after in, after work party or some shit like that. So I said, well, I'm going to go down there and hang out, see Clark, that's my boy. So I went down there with the record still under my hand, right? That's, I didn't even go back to my house. So I walked all the way down to the shelter and um, I get there. I said, what up, Clark? What up, man? Everything's cool. I said, yo, Clark, you, Timmy's playing after you, right? You know, I think Timmy was playing from eight to midnight and Clark was playing from six to eight or something like that. I said, yo, can you put on this record? <laughs> It's funny. Now. I was like, can you put this record on <laughs> right before he plays? Because he's going to be playing house anyway. Clark, yeah, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think about it, that's funny. So Clark plays the record. Timmy runs in the booth. Oh, man, this is so hot. <laughs> to a record that he said. Hey, you're Barbie looking style. at him going. Yo, you're looking at, right, but, what are you thinking at that moment? Come on. It was like an aha moment. Like, oh, shit. Like, this record you said was garbage. Now it all depends on who plays the record. It's not That's the right. record, it's who plays the record. That's didn't right. Make me, didn't kind of make me lose a little respect for him. And that's when I <laughs> <laughs> that's when I opened up to, to the world. I was like, oh, I'm never going to give another big DJ a record again. What I'm gonna do is give it to all the little guys, right? All anybody who ever asked me for a song, I don't care if you work in a club in the in Shibuya, Tokyo, or some hut in South Africa. I'm you're giving gonna, you my song. You're gonna get that record. You're gonna get that record. One of, the reason why is so many more of them than it is of those A-listers. And they will appreciate it more. And to this day, that's my motto. If somebody emails model. and goes, bro, you if you give your record to three DJs that live in some little village in Africa, they're gonna give it to all their friends. How, how, what did, come on, because you must have said something to Timmy when you saw him, he came in the book. What'd you tell him? I was, I was kind of shy back then. I just kind of just, I took it in and was like, hmm, that's interesting. Okay. You know, like, I just kind of took it in. Like, all right, now I know how this works now. You know, I know how to, I know how to work. And it's nothing personal. Like, this is not an attack. It's just like saying, okay. You got to realize something too. And some must forget this when we were in those meetings at those A&R with those, they're not DJing. Their mind is on on projects that are going out, or they got a record that they're trying to break right now, and you're coming in with this thing. It's like they ain't hearing it in their mind until it's they're out of that atmosphere and they're in a, in the club scene. And then it's like, how many times you heard this, Roland? I didn't hear mm -hmm. that record. And you played that mm -hmm. record for the A and R guy, and he says, I didn't hear that record. Mm -hmm. I think in that, I think in that particular case. It was about who I wasn't, right? Right. If I if I wasn't somebody that had a hit record that you respected, then you didn't hear it as a hit record that could be possible a hit record. If I was somebody that was already big and blowing up and that was doing my thing, he would have heard it a different way. So it's almost like if a nobody comes up to you and play you a hit record, you're not going to think it's a hit record because he's not he, he's not he doesn't have any market value. Right. But if a person with market value showed you the same exact record, that record all of a sudden has market value. I think that's what happened at the end of the day with that particular situation. You know, that's what that whole who you know type thing, you know. So I'd rather, sometimes to this day, I'll give a record to somebody who has more market value to me and goes, hey, can you show this to your dude? Oh, man, you know him too. Why don't you show it to him? Yeah, but you have more market value. He'll, he'll, he'll listen to it a different way.
Right. You know, this is coming from him. And I and I have that same feeling too, that same philosophy. It's who brings the record in than what yeah. the record is. Even though the record is quality and we know that, but it's just the setup of setting it up right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all it is. Um like people like Fat Boy Slim, that I love that guy to death because I can give him something and he responds whether he likes it or not. Hey, bro, it's not for me, you know. Or if he goes, I like it, two minutes later, he goes, send me the acapella. And then the next week, I go on YouTube and he's playing it. Like that to me is like, whoa. Like, crazy to me. You know, when somebody of that caliber can, that does that, that means you look at me a certain way, um, even though I don't have that market value that, that you're used to having around you, you know, although I gave him a few hits. But other than that, that goes to that. That's my boy. I love that guy to death. Anyway. No, but that's an example. We're talking about examples. We're not putting them down. You just give me us examples of what how yeah. this, how this game plays. This is a game that's not easy to break through. It's, and... it's, di it's different levels to this thing, right? Some people don't want more much. Some people don't know what's out there. Some people just want their city to like them. You know, that's the one thing I, I learned. Like I heard people complaining about, like I said, how do you, how the guys in their city don't put them down. I was like, we live in America, go to another city, <laughs> go to another state, go to another country. Like you don't have to, you know, so that's kind of like a local way of thinking. Um, and it, I think there's just different levels to this thing. Some people just want to be on the number one guy on track source. And once you reach that, it's like, well, now what, you know? You just, and I think my problem is, is not even my problem, how I think is, I just want to be not only respected, I want to be compensated and respected because I got the respecting down, I hope, you know, now it's the compensation thing. You know, I got friends, I got six or seven friends that are just millionaires, like period. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, we've been doing the same thing for the same amount of time. Hmm. And now it's like, all right, let me not think like that. Let me just get to work. You know, everything happens at its own time. So let me just get, get to work, you know. And like I said, things things kind of happen for me, like I said, against my own, uh, like, let's fast forward to this year, you know, Madison Square Garden. Um, I've known Black Coffee since, I want to say, 09. We met on the plane to Swaziland. And we didn't really have a whole bunch of conversations. And maybe, like, we talked maybe, like, four times between 2009 and now. But an email here and there, a pleasant hello. And I noticed that he played two or three of my acapellas in his mixes. And I, that to me was enough. Like, thank you, buddy. We're good. But when you didn't get invited on a stage like Madison Square Garden, handpicked, it's like, I didn't know that you that you cared so much about what, what I did 30 years ago. You know what I mean? So And how those did are that things. feel? And Roland, come on. How did that feel performing, being up there? Oh, being up there was great, but everything before, like, whatever. Like, I had that whatever attitude because I've seen so many, i see. how can I explain this? I've been around so many things that, that went from zero to nothing, but when it comes to yourself, you, you know, you, you kind of, and it's, it's not a good way to be. You have, um, you have like a defeatist attitude sometimes when you're a musician or, or, or just a creative person. You know, you're more critical of yourself or whatever. So when he when they asked me to do it, I was like, yeah, 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 I'm down, whatever. It's just another show. And they was, oh, but it's Madison Square Garden. I was like, ah, oh, it's just another show. It's just another show. But then the day of the show, you're like, oh shit, I'm 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 sitting in the backstage area of Madison Square Garden. But whatever, it's just it's whatever. But then when you get on the stage, it's like, oh good, like now it now it hits, you know, and it hit, it hit hard. It's like wow, I did that. You know, but I'm now all proud of you. You know, well, no, always, always we're very proud of you that you got the chance to do this. You know, oh, dude, now I want a headline. The garden, like that's the new goal. That's the that's the the demon of this industry. Like when you reach a goal, you're like, that was cool, but I hey, want a headline. This now. <laughs> want this now. I, I want a headline now. <laughs> so that's this is not a bad way to be. It gives you something to reach for. You know, no, and who's, yeah, who's to say it won't happen? Because 
I never thought that would happen. So it's just a, it's just a weird way to be. It's, it's a survival thing, I think, you know. You just want more. You know, I just want more. You know? Well, not everybody, unless you're aspiring for greatness. It, there's a difference, you know. And also mm -hmm. that way of complacency is called jaded. We mm -hmm. all get jaded due to oh, dude. circumstances and the crap that we're dealing with day to day. You get jaded after a while. It's like, come on with that. Get away from me with that shit. I, I became so jaded. I was going to change my middle name to Jade. Like, that's how <laughs> jaded I was. Like, <laughs> when you see the new kids on the block go from here to here, I was, yeah. look, not, not a lot of people know this. I was Chris Brown's first tour manager. Chris Brown's first tour manager. I was there when he sold his first million records i was in the hotels i was looking at all the girls he was bringing in and out at the age of 15. i mean i was there i saw other singers blowing up and then i was like okay this is this is not my life this is his life this is him blowing up and i quit after a year i was like this is dumb i don't want to be a part of his story i want to create my own story you know but i've seen a lot of things so when you see stuff like that and then you go kind of go back to your own life and go back to this little genre called house music. It says a lot about the, the music. The music, it's, it's like um, it's like a good cancer to get, you know? <laughs> it's like, you got it, you got it. It's with you for the rest of your life. It, you know, it may not kill you this one, but you got it, you know? It's so good so, cancer. So go back to now. We're picking up from Victor Cook the life story. So that whole saga goes, and that becomes another big record. Oh, okay. dude, Victor Cook, he's he's like um, Victor's something else, bro. We did the record, and the record did well. Victor went on to get a Tony on on the um, on Broadway. He was in a Broadway play. I, I forgot the name of it. I want to say three tenors or five tenors or something like that. But he went on to get a Tony. You know. And I was like, we just did a song with that guy, <laughs> you know? So we never did a second record. We did a second record, but um, it was called God. It was dope. I don't know what happened to it. But yeah, he just, that record was special because I sat down and wrote that song with him in mind. Like, I don't write songs. It's rare that I write songs for the people who I'm writing the songs for. So I thought about his life and wrote that song. The only other song I wrote um, that was like that, I wrote it for, the original song was meant for Sable Jeffries. And Sable kept missing the session. She just wouldn't show up. And I called her one day and I yelled at her, like, Sable, what the fuck? We had a session, da 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 And we were like brothers and sisters, so we could yell at each other. Oh, Roland, I just forgot, I'll be over next week. I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna get somebody else to sing it. So I had a friend named Kamara Lovelace, and she was like, I'll sing it. And the song was called When Can I Love Begin? And that song blew up. When can I love begin? And I was like, oh, well, like, <laughs> you know, and rest in peace, Sable. I really wanted her to sing that song. But, you know, it was done. It was done well. Yeah, it was done well. You know? No, I know. I know. So, see, I'm glad you mentioned. I I didn't know you were managing Chris Brown. I had no idea about that. Before. I wasn't managing. I was I was his tour manager. Oh, you know what I mean, tour manager. Yeah, this, uh, trust me, it's a big difference. <laughs> it's a huge difference. I'm the guy to make sure your hotel is right. I'm the guy to make sure all the flights are lined up right, book people are going to be in the right seats. Chris is not sitting next to some crazy lady, and you know he's sitting next to his mother. Or, you know, tour managers, you just manage the ins and outs. The manager manages the artist. That's a totally different thing. I'm the guy to make sure you got toilet paper in your room and that the breakfast is <laughs> is hot. <laughs> you know, I'm that guy, you know, but it what played well. You, yeah, I was going to say, what made you and how did that job come about? Oh, dude, at the time I was newly married with a new baby. Uh, my ex-wife was looking at me like, so what are you going to do with your life now? I was like, well, I'm going to do music. She goes, well, that's not really paying. And it wasn't at the time. And I was like, well, I guess I'll get a regular job. So I, I drove to New York just to kind of like exhale. And I'm sitting in my friend Richard Chandler's office. And Richard was like the head of tour management at Jive Records. And um, I was like, yo, my life, you know, that whole, my life sucks. <laughs> and um, he goes, yeah, I got this kid that needs a tour manager if you want to do that. So he showed him to me. I was like, oh, he's like a fake usher. He said, nice. He's really good. <laughs> I love you. Really good. I and love I you. Like, so honest, like a fake I usher. Didn't, 
That's what he was to me because he wasn't big. Nobody knew who he was. I thought he's just like an usher. Spin-off. Big usher. Yeah, so I got the job and that's how that happened. It's like I needed money. I needed to get a real job, but I'd rather do that than work for, for UPS. So I was like, all right, at least I'm in the music business still. Staying in the game, staying somewhat in the yeah, game. Yeah, just kind of staying somewhat in the game. And trust me, I've thought about doing this a billion other times. Like every year I go, I quit. I'm getting the regular job. I'm gonna be a regular guy and da 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 da. And then something happens. Like, no, you're not. Boom. You know, David got a boom. You know, like things just kind of happen, you know, and it, it kind of keeps you in. Like I said, it's like a good cancer. That's the only way I can describe it. I know people are gonna be so like, that I got did you do any records while you were on tour management or you just kept yourself away from the from your production work and stuff? I do. I, I, I stopped. I mean, I had so many records out at the time. I didn't have to do a record. It was just like, all right, I got 20 records out working for me. So I stopped. Like I wasn't home for like six months. Like I, it was it was a it was a terrible job for a married person with a new baby. Put it that way. That's a job for a single person. You know, you don't see your wife and your kid. That sucks, no matter how much money you're making. And I was making a lot of money, <laughs> a lot, you know, and connections. Forget the connections were great. I mean, it just wasn't a great job at the time. It was just, it was, it was very lonely. You know, it was weird, you know? Yeah, because you're doing, did you do the whole world or were you just doing the U.S. leg? This is, this is a U.S. mall tour. And I'll never forget, um, we started in Texas where I got yelled at because he left his mic in new york i was like i didn't get hired until just now it was like well that's not our problem i was like wow that's how this is going to be so the mall tour was like nobody knew we was in texas by the time we got to kentucky i think that was a third city the mall there was a couple of girls that kind of heard about them by the time we got to the seventh mall it was a mall tour which believe it or not they had to shut down the mall that's how many that's how fast it happened for him it was just like shut it down you know now we're doing radio the billboard music awards and i quit right before the grammys i was like i'm not doing this anymore this this is not what i was meant to do and i I was like this is dumb okay so from that point you give them their goodbye and you're out yeah that was it you got a a son a wife yeah you come back to jersey i guess at that no atlanta atlanta at the time I, t- I went back to my married life. I mean, I, I was still writing songs, but under under uh, duress. It was weird, dude. It was like, because I always said to myself, if I can't survive and feed myself in music, then I'm, I guess I'm just going to die. That was just my attitude. It wasn't like, I'll do anything to live. It's like, nope, I'll only do music to live, and then I die. And I think I meant it <laughs> because... I, I could never see myself working for somebody else. And I guess when you got a wife and kid, it's like, yeah, but you got, it's, like, it's that yeah, but thing. And it's like, I know, but it was just like this. It was like, a, and it was like, subsequently it was a divorce. Um, and then it, you just pick up where you left off, you know, from before then. You're like, all right, I guess I got to start writing songs again now, you know? Yeah. People, I don't know, many people look at songwriting as if this is something, and I'll, for me, I don't know about anybody else, they look at it like, oh man, you're so lucky, you get to go in the studio and be all there all day, and I was like, Well, explain no, that, yeah, explain that part, what that, what does that really mean when, you know? Well, for me, I don't know about, other, other, I know people that goes, oh, I can't wait to go to the studio, it's like, really? I can't wait to get the fuck out, like, are you crazy? <laughs> like, like, dude. If I'm sitting in front of a computer for an hour, I'm going crazy. Unless I'm actually doing something. Let's say if I'm in the, I'm in the middle of a vocal, yeah. If I'm cutting down some keys, yeah, I'm busy. But to be in the studio for the sake of being in a studio sucks to me. It's like, oh, like I'll be in the middle of a song, right? I'm working on somebody else's record. And I just, if I see one hot girl on Instagram, I go, ooh, who's that? You know? And I Everything investigate. Stops. Everything stops. Oh, it's a rabbit hole from hell. <laughs> and so you, you go, go down the hole and you're done. <laughs> no, then you mentally are tired from being a creep for, <laughs> for 20 minutes. And you go, damn, I'm hungry. Yo, I have ADHD, by the way. I say, damn, I'm hungry. And I'll get up. I'll drive an hour away to my favorite restaurant in Annapolis. I'll eat and goes, oh, shit, what time is it? Oh, it's only 7 o'clock? I bet you that movie's out. Look, this all started with me in a session. Next, you know, I'm at a movie. <laughs> and then 
this is this is real uh, this is a real disorder adhd i'm at a movie now it's midnight and i go oh shit! i'll show me cutting that record let me go home and cut the record now it's 1 30 in the morning because i drove an hour like an idiot to get something to eat i come back <laughs> i open up the laptop you know i take a shower i'm all ready to re, re like start recording again i go damn i'm tired nah, i'm going to bed and that's essentially my whole life <laughs> that's how i live my life. it's weird dude it's a weird disorder to have but uh, it's, it kept me going all these years it's weird so you work when you feel like the moment happens and if it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't yeah because you can't force a great idea so how know, do you, you deal with other people like if do you do because you, back in the old times we'd be in studios getting together to write songs oh back then it was great the old times the old times you're with your friends You'd be laughing, you know, joking. You're laughing. Yo, let's go to the diner, get a bacon, egg, and cheese. Come back. You know, we, no, we might meet some girls in the street, bring them up just to impress them. Like, look, you know, I'm in the studio, and maybe one of you might get lucky. It was never me. Um, and it was just fun. It was, a, it was a physical thing to do with your friends. You know what I mean? It was just here, nowadays, you're by yourself, and you're in this basement, and it's dark, you know? <laughs> And you get these thoughts. <laughs> you're not hanging out with your buddies because you're married and your wife is upstairs by herself. Like, um, babe, are you going to spend any time with me? <laughs> you know, so you probably know what that's like. Like, what the hell? Um, but yeah, it's, it's a different experience. Like I said, you're doing the same job at a different age, at a different state in your life. But it's the same job and you're, you're going to approach it differently. I'm really lazy, dude. I'll, People keep saying, oh man, you work so hard. I'm like, no, I don't. I actually do, I'm the laziest person you'll probably ever meet. It's just that when I actually do something, it, I do a lot of it, you know what I mean? It just seems like a lot because I've done a lot, but the actual process of it all, mm -mm, I'm lazy as hell. But you, but here's the thing, everybody, he's playing around for 12, 13 hours and 30 minutes writes the song. Figure mm -hmm. that out, figure out what he just did. So he'll mm -hmm. do that. Monday, he'll do that Tuesday, he'll do that Wednesday. Yeah. Well, then, not all songs are 30 minutes now. Don't get it twisted. So well, you say, know what I mean. I don't mean 30 but minutes, if, but you know if I get it, if I get a great idea, right? The past couple of days I've had great ideas for songs. I was cutting one song every day, which is rare for me. But it's almost like um when you get a great idea, you can't let it go. You have to finish it to completion. If the idea is not great, it's like it's like sex, right? You're, you're having sex with this chick and you're not feeling it. You kind of want it to be over with. Like, ugh, you know, like, I'm not, I don't know whether it's me or you, but this ain't working. You know, you just kind of like, oh, okay, well, that was that. But if it's great sex, you're like, I want to do some more, you know, <laughs> let's go two more rounds. But that's how I approach music. If the song is starting off great, let's go two more rounds. I want to finish this. I got to finish this record, you know. Because you're feeling just, it. You're in it. I'm feeling it. I'm in it. <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> you're in it to so, win it. Everything about yeah, it. Man. All yeah, that. But sometimes not every song is great. I, I've written songs that I got 80% finished with the song. I was like, this sucks. Okay. You know? That's a question yeah. I want to ask you. Which song would you say that you said, this effing sucks, but turned out to be the one you go, holy, I never saw it to happen like that. Like big. That's a good question. I'm pretty sure there's a whole bunch of them. Well, Flowers is one of them, believe it or not. Um, well, Flowers started out like, I, ain't, I don't even want to do the damn thing. I don't want to do this record. Like, it was just I like some... I remember when you told me you wrote it, you said, like, I didn't, I never wanted to do that record. I'm like, yeah, Flowers is one of them. Um, half those songs, I don't even, I forget what they are, but that's how terrible they are. It's just like, <laughs> but if, they, if they came out, if they came out and they did well, I'm trying to think. I put out so many records, dude, because my brain won't even hold that many songs in my head. I got to tell you, I got to let you know. Something. I don't even know because I put out stuff that I could tell you stuff that came out that I thought was going to do great. That okay. didn't. So, so tell us this way. Tons yeah. of records, dude. I could just go on, I, just go on track source and put my name in and go. Is that that's that song that I thought was going to be great <laughs> that didn't do well? Like eighty percent of my songs don't do well. 80%, but that 20% that does well makes up for it. You know what I mean? Like no one ever goes, hey, did you hear that song that's that that didn't do great on the charts? No one ever says that. Did you hear that song that Roland put out that sucked? Nobody ever says that. They only go, did you hear that song that 
that shit is dope. Nobody ever talks about the the negative like side. It doesn't of that. exist. Like it doesn't exist. Like it just it can't. doesn't exist if it sucks. Who talk? Who wants to talk about that? They only talk about the good stuff. Yeah, know? but it doesn't really mean that it sucks. It just didn't. It just didn't latch on that because the the quality is there. It's just look. That's what every writer. Come on, dude. Every writer. Well, here, that. well with that being said, this is what I don't like, and I kind of know why they do it. I don't like when people re-release songs within the same two months, right? Two months later. Like you put out a record, it doesn't do well. And they do this to my record. So if I sign a, a record to a label to put out the record, it doesn't do well. Then two months later, they re-release it with a different cover. Same song, that doesn't do well. They, they keep re-releasing the same song three or four times a year. And it's like, dude, you're getting in the way of the stu- of my stuff now. You know, like the stuff that I'm trying to do. Like you keep you re-releasing stuff. the same record over and over and over again. And I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm fighting myself to get on, on the chart or on some kind of feature banner. It's like, you're kind of messing it up for me. So it's just a weird thing that people do, but I know why they do it. You know, why? They, 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 why do they to, do it? They're trying to make their money back. They're like, that's we right. This guy. They're trying to get their investment back. They're hoping they to get paid their- all this money to fucking roll and we knew he wasn't worth it. <laughs> <laughs> we knew he wasn't worth it. Rolling ain't crap, man. He's killing he us. With his, he said to give us some bull crap. But that's not what you intended. You didn't intend when you were doing that. Come on. Every, you did. every song I, well, I, here's the one thing I've never done. I've never done a record for somebody lazily. Like I always, if somebody goes, yo, it's been three weeks, where's our vocal? I'm like, do you want a fast vocal or do you want a good vocal? Which one do you want? And they go, good. I'm like, well, then shut the fuck up. And let me finish. <laughs> you know, just be like, you. we just met two just weeks be ago. Patient. Just be patient. Be patient. Like I haven't known you all my life. So all of a sudden you're going to rush me? I'm like, Shut up. Like, let me finish doing what I'm doing. And the end result, they always go, all right, you was right. I like it. It's like, all right. Now, if I would have rushed it and gave you, you some crap. Me, yeah, you tell me it sucks then. Yeah. So relax, you know. So that's that's where I'm at right now. But, Roland, um, when you stepped in the game back at the time when you were landscaping, what was the oh, music? Was- okay. So what was the music you were thinking you were going to be making and working on? I wasn't thinking, I wasn't in my mind. I, I'm not, remember, I was technically not in the music industry. I was just some no, that kid. Just hanging out, hanging out. So what were you listening to at that time? Just what was on the radio, Prince, just whatever. What was on the radio? It, house music didn't exist when I was doing that stuff. That's only exist- very clear. Yeah, I only, I only went to Zanzibar maybe once back then. You know, in those days I was 19 and 20. It wasn't in my world. I think that the, my first introduction to really like house music, like house house music, was when I um, met, physically met Tony Humphrey. Because I remember he walked into the studio at Calliope and he was like, because I was a receptionist. <laughs> and he was like, I'm Tony Humphrey, I'm here for a session. I was like, oh shit, you're the guy on the radio. That's what I said. Oh, that's, that's, that's the guy on the, on the radio. And that was my first boom. Then I met like these other guys who was working there named Winston Jones, who wrote Mumpumbe. Mumpumbe, way, way. Um, Paul Simpson, who wrote Gotta See You Tonight. Like those are the first guys I actually knew who did house music. And they actually taught me how to do it. I was like, yo, how do you do bass lines? And Paul Simpson sat me down and go, this is how you do a bass line. And he showed me, because I asked. And it just, that door just kept getting wider and wider. And then I met Merlin and he put out my records. It was just like it was just like this. It just like a fire lit in a freaking forest. It was weird, dude. Because that's what people don't understand. There was a there was a camaraderie back then. You started at the reception, but yet you found your way into the studio. I wasn't even trying to do it. I wasn't like in my mind. Well, you I asked him. You asked him how to make a bass, yeah. but. Because you know, I was bored and this guy was sitting there and that's what he did. So it's almost like being a plumber, right? If you was hanging out with these plumbers, you're going to go, yo, how do, you, how do you do that? You know, like you're just out of curiosity. Who knew? You know, I knew I was in the music industry when like for good, forever and for good was when um I did all right. When I did all right, I was like, people started saying my name with the song. You know what I mean? All right. So being that you're green at that time did anybody help you put the record together you just went in and started playing the keys and all that what oh, did you do dude, what did you 
the first person that made me sit down and write my own song, he made me sit down and write my own song was Ronald Burrell. The Burrell twins. You, I think you interviewed them. I have and I know them very well. <clears throat> yes. When I met the Burrells, and they were they were a big part of my life, believe it or not. When I met them, I thought they were like gangsters. They looked kind of mean, you know. Yeah, everybody thought like, that back then. Everybody I was like, like I was like, these guys I said, I know they killed somebody. So they was like, <laughs> they was like, yo, man, you used to live in Jersey. I was like, yeah, they said, we from Jersey. I was like, all right, cool. They said, yeah, we live in uh where they live, Cranberry or some shit like that. No, East Brunswick. Right. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, what the hell is that? He said, come out one day. So I took a train out there. It was fucking far. I remember going to the house and their basement was disgusting, bro. It had like tapes all over the floor, cassettes. I mean, remember, because imagine having your carpet just flooded with cassettes. And the studio was just like this reel and this old keyboard and stuff I didn't just just a it was a junky place. But I remember going, yo, we should clean up. And I started picking up the cassettes and organizing stuff. And I would listen to some of that music. I was like, oh, this shit is bad. This is dope. This is good. And they, these guys, was, they were like happy in the studio working, like cutting boom, 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 boom. And I would be sleeping on the couch in the basement. And I would sleep through stuff like Reggie writing strings, you know, or Ronald writing the Bonoir stuff, you know? Like, what's the song? I'm glad you came to me, right? Oh, no, it's My Love is Magic. I was going to say, it's got to be My Love is Magic. Dude, I was on the couch, sleep. I was writing My Love is Magic, and there was a MIDI glitch in the studio that made all the freaking MIDI um, keyboards turn to piano sound by mistake. Ronald couldn't find the sounds again, so he just made all the songs piano songs, and that's how that song Because of the made. mistake, right? The electrical mistake that happened, it right? It was all, if you listen to that song, every part in there is piano. Yeah, I know. Everything. That, that wasn't on purpose. <laughs> but to see there, like, little things. Those guys, they taught me, like, Ronald taught me, he, Ronald taught me how to just kind of sit down. Like, just, just, when you start something, finish it. Just finish the record, you know. And just they hanging out. The basics. They gave you all the fundamental parts to get you off the ground. You know, they, they made me see that things were possible. Like, when they came back with their deal with Virgin Records, I was like, I know some guys who just got to deal with Virgin Records. That was my thing. Like, wow. Like, one day Reggie came down with a check for thirty thousand dollars that he got from SBK Records. I've never seen that type of money in my life. And I was like, Yo, how the hell did you get that money? He goes, Remember those tracks I was doing the other day? I was like, That's it. <laughs> so that made me go. Well, I got. I'm going to start a song and try to get a deal with SBK. So I wrote All Right, Urban Soul. That's how All Right came to be. So. Just they gave me this 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 push that I needed, you know. You needed to see somebody that looked like you doing it, in order to think that it was possible. And that that, that was my yeah. That's it. The golden carrot was flung in front of you. The incentive. Oh, dude, those guys are my brothers. Like I I literally live with them. Like I'd stay down there for like a week at a time <laughs> and just hang out. And then every Saturday we get in the car and we drive forty five minutes to Zanzibar, and somebody will try to pick up a girl or two, you know. That, that was our life, you know, this, just, our life was music and we was enjoying it back then. It was just like, you know, I don't know. No, it's it a great somebody. story because it's, it's That's really funny. part of the official start of this whole house music industry thing that happened. <clears throat> yeah. And, this, you, this, and you were there, you know, you were there, like they say, Thomas Edison made the ball. Well, that was, was what was happening. All that mm -hmm. was coming together in the beginning. Yes. There's no, there's no mistakes when it comes to when things, I don't know about anybody else, but there was no mistakes when these things were rolling themselves out to me, you know, like meeting those guys, being able to hang out with those guys, like to a point where their mother was my mother, you know, like, you know, um, and just your life experiences with the people around you, they, they kind of help build you and shape you creatively and with your character, you know? So you just gotta kind of just be careful we hang out with these days, not these days, but in general, if you're young, because that stuff rubs up on you, it rubs off on you, like it's, it's, it's weird. But um, dude, there's so many stories, like it's just, it's just too many things to talk. I need to write a book, <laughs> but it's a lot. It's a lot out there to unravel when it comes to the music industry, the game. Um, 
yeah, dude, it's just, it's, a, it's a lot, you know. It's that's a lot. That's an important part because the Burrells are a big beginning for a lot of people, just like yourself. Their story still today holds weight. Even they were the first. They were the first people I met that didn't have an A and R tell them what to put out. Reggie would write a song or a track, take it up the new group, and go say, hey, "Frank, put this out." That was it. I never saw that in my life. We're like, wait a minute, is he going to listen to it? He's like, I don't care what he likes. It's just, I want it out. And I was like, they were un <laughs> you know. And they were the first people that I saw who people was collecting their music. Like I didn't know anybody who had their music collected because they put it out. Like I didn't know that existed, but they, it was the first a lot. I never heard people do jazz and house all in one track. I was like, how the hell do you guys do that? Like he'll do a jazz thing. And they started out a lot of stuff that people don't even know that they started. Like they, they, they just did it. I was like, so you just do records and put them out. You don't shop them. They were like, nope. You and you're going out. to yourself, what do you mean? What do you mean you don't shop them? <laughs> right? Because we were always saying that back then. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? You don't take them around. No, we just put no. them out. Just put them out. How's that possible? Oh, we just tell oh. Frank, we just tell Frank what we're here. Yeah, we're, yeah, put them out. We called it sneaker money. Like when we when like when we did shop music, because we had no bills, we didn't really have families or anything like that. It was just us. So we call it sneaker money. We go, yo, man, I'm going to the city today. I got a couple of tracks I want to shop. So we started off at Strictly Rhythm. Um, and back then they heard your record right there. You know, there was no meeting. You just show up, you play your track and they go yes or no. So we started Strictly Rhythm. We might might head over to um, Emotive, which was on 21st Street at the time. That's then we right. go to Kings, then we go to King Street. Then we go up to Ner Nervous. Like we, we, we hit all these labels in one day. Right. And all we need is one to hit a city records. All we needed was one person to cut us a check. It was like, yes, I got me some sneaker money, you know? <laughs> and it was like 2,000 bucks and you call it sneaker money. Like I got sneaker money, you know? And cause it, it was, we buy sneakers every time we got money. It was just like, let's get sneakers. It's like a celebration thing. It was weird. Ah, dude, would you do, okay. So that part of your life, would you do that over? Yeah. Yeah. Because it got me to, the next thing you know what i mean i would take it more seriously like i would if i knew what i knew then oh jesus I, that's a 2020 20 vision that's 20 yeah 20 vision. yeah, you, yeah don't get, you don't get that chance you, i'm just asking no, I, I would do it over because one thing always leads to the next thing you know what i mean like that one thing always leads to the next thing like if todd like i take an example i rem remember i was singing that falsetto way like like in my falsetto I remember I used to sing, I don't do shows anymore. I don't do stage shows anymore. Besides that Madison Square Garden thing, I wasn't doing stage shows because I hated the fact that I had to drink tea and lemon and I couldn't talk loud because <laughs> I hated that. It just felt so ill, like, ugh. So, <laughs> and I, think, I think Todd heard me complaining one day. And, what did Todd um, say to you? What did he say? He's like, he said, man, don't, don't sing then, just, just talk on tracks. He said, just talk on track. He goes, matter of fact, I got something you can do. He said, do you know how to imitate a preacher? I think I can imitate a preacher. I got this record with um, Martha Walsh <laughs> and, and Jocelyn Brown called Something Feeling Good in Your Soul. You know, just do the preacher part in the beginning, write, write something. I wrote this preacher part. That record blew up. In other words, that's all I gotta do is just talk. The spoken word thing I did was I get deep. That was Todd Terry saying, don't sing, just talk. So if that day didn't happen where I was complaining about drinking tea. <laughs> and everybody knows Roland. If you know Roland, we all know Roland. <clears throat> he's always complaining. I'm always complaining. That's Roland. Even when he's I'm happy, the, he's complaining. I'm the Bill Burr of house. <laughs> oh, yes. If Roland Clark is not complaining, something is wrong. Listen, everyone. If he's not you gotta he's, complain. Yo, if he's happy, I'm worried. Yo, I'm worried if somebody's always happy. Like, hey, buddy, how you doing? Everything's great. I'm like, get the fuck away from me. No, I'm wait, hang on. You. He's fake. Get him away. He's fake. <laughs> get away from me. I don't trust you. You're always freaking happy. Uh, I, I, I don't complain a lot. I, I only complain because I want things to be better. I know things could be better. That's just me. It's not a, I'm not a negative person. I just go, 
Man, this is some bullshit. Like I said, I feel like I'm the Bill Burr, or, and I'm the Bill Burr and Louis C.K. of House. You know, like so you got all these great stories and all these great moments, which I know eventually you will sit down when with your ADHD and write some sort of book or tell somebody something to make them write the book. But you're at the stage of your life now, which is the third part of your life, which is the tech techie side of your life now. And tech out stuff. Now hang on. I remember when the DJing began. How did that start? Because be pre to that, I, I never knew you to be playing out like that. Oh, this is what happened. Don't so in, 19, in 1999, uh, Fat Boy Slim, well, Norman Cook, contacted me and goes, oh, you better than clock. And I was like, yeah. He goes, he goes, I sampled your song. How much do you want? And I was like, I don't understand the question. Yeah, that's a question that's hard to answer. How and much he, do you want? But what he was really saying was, oh, the record's coming out next week. And I was like, oh, like, oh, so this is a, this, no, I, I can just tell you a number. So I gave him a number. It wasn't too bad because I wanted the relationship to, to, to last. I don't want him to think I was some money hungry guy. I, I gave him a, good, a nice number that he, that he could do. Um, they got in touch with me again and goes, hey, he's going to, Norman Cook's going to be in New York if you want to meet him at the Virgin Mega Store. I said, yeah, I would love to meet him. I lived only four blocks away from Virgin Megastore on, on, on 14th Street. I met him. That was surreal. I was like, wow, I'm meeting this guy in Fat Boy Slim that everybody loves. It was lying out the door. The place was packed. And I remember he asked me after all of it was done. He goes, do you DJ? And I went, no, why? He goes, oh, man, that's too bad. And I was like. What do you mean it's too bad? <laughs> he was going to ask me to go on tour with him. And that's when I went, I need to learn how to DJ. So I, when I lived, um, I went, remember DJ Camacho, Camacho? Of course I remember Camacho, may yeah. he rest in peace. I went, to Camacho's, Camacho. <laughs> I went to Camacho's house every Sunday to eat because his wife always cooked Cookie. like chicken and mac and cheese. Cookie. So, yeah, so I went to the house, it's like, yo man, can you teach me how to DJ? <laughs> he goes, I'll teach you how to DJ if you give me your S950 sampler. I was like, bet, so I gave him my sampler. It was on turntables too. So, you know, he got this record collection. He goes, pick two songs you like that kind of in the same tempo. I was like, all right, so I'm playing the songs. He goes, make sure the kicks match, like tempo wise. I was like, okay. He said, it's just like sampling, just lock it up. So after 10 minutes, I was like, okay. He's like, there you go. Now you're DJing. And I was like, get out of here. He goes, that's it. He said, just practice. So every Sunday, I will go down there and practice, you know on vinyl like like a couple of hours or whatever and i was like i think i'm a dj now but i, I didn't have any gigs there was like nothing i was like all right i, I know how to dj now what and i think my first gig was um it was some club in england and this one defected was like just really starting to blow up and it was with uh sting international and it was weird dude i didn't have any records with me i was just gonna play some stuff Sting had, like just for like 20, 15 minutes. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to Defected today and just grab some records. I grabbed the crate of records, just put stuff in the in the crate. I didn't even listen to them, bro. I just put them in the crate. <laughs> I took them to go DJ. I said, Sting, whatever you do, don't leave the DJ booth. I'm nervous. I don't even think I know how to DJ anymore. I was like, don't leave. Yo, everything that I came out that crate, I didn't even listen to it. I just put it on, blended it. Everything worked. Everything just, it was magical, dude. The people got on the floor. The floor was packed. I looked to my right. Sting is gone. He disappeared. And I'm like, what the fuck? So he comes back for his show. He goes, yo, I thought you didn't know how to DJ. I was like, I don't. He goes, what are you doing now? Right. And I went, As I said, I would have said to you, what are you doing now? Look at the and desk. I was, mm -hmm. I was like, I was like, that's when I was like, I guess I'm a DJ. You're a DJ I'm now. a DJ now. I'm a DJ now. And that was it. Like, that just that confidence alone for somebody saying something. Yes, you're doing it from somebody like that. I was like, okay, I guess that's what I do, <laughs> you know. And that's how it all kind of started. You know, then I would get gigs here and there, you know, in Japan and all that crap. Um, it was all good, but you know, I complain all the time about stuff. Like, when the first time I saw I, I played in Japan, I wasn't used to people looking at the DJ. 
I was like, am I not doing good? Because nobody's dancing. They're just looking at me. Because no, that's, like that's what they do now. I was like, nobody's dancing, though. He's what's like, wrong? yeah, that's, what's wrong with I, them? It was like the children of the corn type shit. I was like, how come they're not, <laughs> how come they're not dancing? <laughs> it was weird. They were just looking at me and bobbing their head. I was like, they go, that's what that means they like you. I was like, that's freaking weird, dude. I had to get used to that. I was like, wow. So it was weird. Yeah, it was weird. <laughs> Roland's always in those come to light situations. Come to the light. Yeah, dude, it's weird. What's wrong like, with these people? Why are they acting like that? They're mummies. You're not, you're not dancing. They're now dancing. I don't care. Yeah, the only other gig that I wish they were dancing at was I just did Ushuaia, uh se September, I want to say September 20th, 19th. And I hate when I'm on a stage by myself and you can't have people around you. I like that people around you thing because it gives me that energy. And it's just you and the crowd. And the crowd's enjoying you, but I'm like, this somebody dance, like just somebody, so I can look at you. But they were just like, I'm like, I need a signal. I need something. I need some kind of energy, some transfer of some energy. Brazil is like that. Brazil, when you go to Brazil, they dance. Brazil, their house scene is like our '90s house scene now, bro. It's, it's Brazil is incredible. It's, I, there's only one word to say it. That place is like magical. Are they asking you to do like what Robert Owens does? Put a mic on you so that you can actually do any of your speaking? Or you they just... don't ask. They don't ask. I just do it. That's what I do. do so that's your show now, right? You're doing this talking and and. Yeah, it's not through the whole show. It's only a certain part of the night where I feel like the energy of that that room or that crowd is at that point where it's like. I need to say something, you know, and then I get on the mic goes, I'll turn down the music and goes, how everybody's doing, blah, 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 blah. And then I go, you guys want to hear me sing? I always ask. <laughs> and they go, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, they say no. I'll be like, oh, we're perfect. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, let me keep DJing. Go ahead. I, I got my money. I got my money anyway. No, but um, the last time I was in Brazil, there was this girl up front. I'll never forget this girl. She had this long ponytail. And she thoroughly enjoyed me being there. That's the, the energy I got from Like She was like, oh my God, it's you, that energy. And I didn't play for anybody except for her. Oh, and nice. what I did was somewhere in the middle of the set, she kept going like this, like, that sounds, that looks weird when I do it on mic. <laughs> she kept going like this, like, <laughs> she kept going like, sing, sing. Sing, you're thinking <laughs> so, something else, you dirty man, you. So, yeah, I was like, what? So I turned down the music all the way and goes, I'm sorry, everybody, but this girl up front wants me to sing a song for, is that okay? And they went, yeah. And I just sang acapella for her, bro. And the place went berserk. What did you, you know, say? I just made up words randomly in my head. Just oh, for her. okay. It wasn't like it was like you sang flowers and those. No, no, no. I just sang random, just to show like, this, I can sing, Your the DJ can sing. And she just, yo, the place went nuts. And I just turned the music back up, and that was that was like a, a moment for me too. It was like wow, that was that wasn't planned. That was natural, you know. That was that was from the heart, and I like moments like that. You know, those moments are incredible to me. You know, when's when's the when do you feel like you, you know? I know when you got married, you went on the Chris Brown tour. When did you feel like this is not worth doing this at all anymore? Like every morning, <laughs> every morning, you every morning. Look, cause we know you're the Bill Burr. We know we should give you a microphone and just let you complain about everything. We know that, but I was wrong with this industry, man. Everything, nah, I mean, I swear to God, you know, because if I'm not put it this way, if I'm not on tour, if I'm not in front of people, you know, I always need accolades, I always need somebody patting me on the back, I always need somebody going, You're the best. I don't have any of that ever, so. I got to create that for myself, you know, like we talked earlier about these lights, right? Yeah, why people want to know why the lights are going. Because I want to feel like I'm in a club because I'm making music. I'm like, because I live in this little town called Waldorf, Maryland, and outside of these doors is just military families and government workers, and it's not the energy of what I do. So I See, everybody's least, thinking you're the cosmopolitan person you are, New York guy, Jersey guy, that you be like mm -hmm. down in the hottest spot right now. Oh, no, dude, no, no. I did that life, though. I lived in South Beach for like years, and, and it got old, 
you know, I lived in Atlanta. I lived in Atlanta strippers. That got old. And then I was like, oh shit, I'm getting old. You're like, that's not, that is me, <laughs> you know? So, but I still need that excitement around me. I need, I need, I need some kind of energy around me. And usually that comes from younger pe people, younger than me. So, <laughs> yeah, when I go to New York, I always go to younger clubs, younger places where I can be around younger people, you know, and it, it, it it's a different kind of energy. That's all. They're not, you know, I don't want to see anybody on a walker trying to dance to like, you know, South Soul Disco. It's like, that doesn't make me happy. I'd rather go to a tech house club and just feel that energy or a techno club and feel that thump and just, I want to be involved with what's happening now. I don't want to be involved with what happened yesterday. I don't want to live in nostalgia. That's like, a, a it's a good place to go to visit, but not to stay, <laughs> you know? And I see a lot of people I know that th that's where they live. And it's like, I don't want to live there. I want to go visit, but not live, you know? So that's why I started doing tech house and techno because I, I want to live there now, you know? And one day I might go, oh, I just want to visit that place. I want to go somewhere else now. It might be classical music, it might be country music. I'll be like, man, remember I used to do house music back in the day? I'll even talk different. I don't care, you know? But you always got to keep moving. You always got to keep changing. You always got to keep evolving in order to be the person that you can look back on and go, hey, I was I was like 12 different people in my lifetime. And those guys, this guy was crazy, but that guy was funny. And this guy was kind of depressing, he complained a lot. And this guy was this, you know? You, you want to be different people. You don't want to be the same person all the freaking time, the whole your life. You want to you want to try things out, you know? And that's what I do when it comes to music. I just try different things out and I've been lucky enough to have it work for me in my favor, you know? And that's the thing. You've been very blessed that way. That it, The luck, you know, that you, well, blessed and lucky is a, to me is the same, uh, that your decisions were right at the moments that needed to be mm -hmm. made at that time. Yeah. Because... A lot of us stood with the stuff we knew and loved it and became like the steam machine. Who the hell uses mm -hmm. steam anymore? Who yes. uses petrol? You know, when electric is now the new thing, it's, you know, yeah. a lot of people can't make that change. It's not that easy for a lot of people. You're well, a lot of, well, I, I don't, it's just, I, it's not for everyone. Like I said, some people like to, they like their comfort zone. They like their crowd. Their crowd is their family. When I go back to Jersey, that's what I see. I love going back to Jersey because it's the same faces doing the same thing. And I get to go back to a moment in time to right. go, wow, I remember that guy from 20 years ago. He's still dancing. Look at that. And that's the same DJ. You know, it's like a snapshot in the time. But the difference is that that's good for them. They like to live in that space. I like to visit and come back every now and then. And I, I miss it sometimes. I wish I can just do soulful house and be like, woo, I did another one. But that's not how my, my brain works. I mean, like besides the ADHD, I'm pretty sure that has a lot to do with it. I need change constantly, you know, you know it's weird. So how do you motivate yourself now being in a military town and all that? Oh, I go to Bank of America. I look at my account and go negative. Hmm, that's gotta change. <laughs> No, motivation, it comes in different forms. It just comes in different forms. Normally, we, when I don't feel like myself, if I find myself just driving aimlessly because I need some air or whatever, I always go, yeah, maybe I need to get back to basics, which means let me just write a song. And when I feel like that, normally the song comes out great because I'm re I'm re it's like a reset, you know? I just get back to basics, like just write a song, you know? That's it. It all boils down to that one thing. Look, without you writing a song or writing a track, a whole industry don't exist. Think about that. This starts with us. And now it's a stage being built for this big dude, you know, but it all started with the seed. We're the seeds that planted the stuff that made it grow. And look at it. You got to be proud of that little part that you had even 20 30 years ago you you were part of that growth so now you can look at a stage and see 20,000 people looking at that one guy that has nothing to do with you but you was a part of that just be proud that you was a part of that you you was part of that that those seeds that made that thing grow to that you know it, it's 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 a so it's, it's a surreal thing very surreal yeah it's a good way um, of looking at it sure it's part of part yeah. of the being a pioneer in a sense. You're, 
You're, we're all part of history. Well, the Johnny you know? Appleseed, we were dropping seeds all over the place, and now trees are fully grown, and those are our mm -hmm. trees, you know, but others are cutting them down and making beautiful furniture and stuff from the stuff that we you left behind. You know, it's just that's how you see it. Yeah, I could see it that way. I wrote a song for Black Coffee a couple years ago called um, 100 Zulu Warriors. And I think part of the lyrics was, our seeds will grow, just have faith, um, and get, and they'll give life someday to our way. And I wrote that before Black Coffee was like who he is now. And right before Madison Square Garden show, I, I wrote the, the lyrics out and I sent it to him like, yo, the lyrics came true. You know, our seeds grew because we had faith and they gave life to this way of life for us, you know? And especially as black men, to see him as a black man doing what he does at the level makes me think it's possible for me or somebody who looks like me who's younger than me, you know? So that's that's what I mean by just growth and believing and that this thing is possible and knowing that you was part of the story. Like a hundred years from now, somebody's gonna log onto the internet and goes, Hey mommy. There's a guy named Lenny Fontana. He's got this really cool song I like, you know, <laughs> and we're long dead and gone, you know. So you're like, wow, that's gonna be that's gonna be somebody's favorite track, you know. That live great, on. Great, that lives great, on way past mm -hmm. us. Oh, I know. That's that's how I that's how I want to I want I want to be that that guy. That so guy. the epitaph will be let the music live on forever. Yeah, we're gonna die. Oh, we, we know we we know we're not here forever from dust yeah. to dust. But everything we do, especially now because of the internet, is going to be here forever. You know, you know. I think that's the importance of some of these sites too. Um, I you know I always I complain like oh track source didn't give me a banner, <laughs> but at the end of the day they're 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 the housing department for our music right now. You know, Beatport they're the housing they house our creativity, so people can find it you know, and along with iTunes and Spotify and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's just some place to keep your creative soul. It's a place to store it for now. Yeah. And for, so a hundred years from now, that's your great, 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 <laughs> great grandkid. Great, though. great, 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 great. Yeah. Great. My, my uncle Lenny did this record, you know, and you might inspire him to do something, you know? So it's weird, dude. It's weird. It's weird getting older, though. It's like it's like ugh. This it's That's great, and it's. I was just gonna ask you, how do you embrace this and acceptance of getting older with this? I don't, dude. I'm so immature. Yeah. So no what do you do? Idea. What do you do for that? What do you do? I, I I don't do shit. I I date young girls and and <laughs> and have no accountability for anything. I mean, that was old. Wait, wait, hang on, everyone. We know <laughs> not, rolling, though that that's rolling state. No accountability. We know that. No, no, I have account. I swear, look, to tell you the truth, women, women, let's get to women now. Most women my age would never date me because I've done this, I've done the marriage thing. I was married before. I know what it's like. I was like, all right, I did that. You know, this one girl was like, oh, would you ever get married again? I was like, no, why would I do that? You know, well, what if you love them? I was like, oh, that's, oh, oh, I can love again forever. Well, then why not marry them? I said, well, those, those are two different things, you know, so. Well, define that to the to the people what that means. Love and marriage. Love, like Sinatra wrote it. Love and oh, marriage. Yeah. Love and I think you can love. I I met this one girl in Atlanta, who I fell in love with from the first time I saw her. And love doesn't mean you have to get with them or be together. It just means you love them. And then when I met her, we start to know each other. She wasn't in the right, her right state, to see what I what I had to offer and I wasn't in my right state to even have the, the nerve to offer it up. It was just weird. Didn't change the fact that I loved her. And to this day, I see her on the internet, I go, oh my God, I love her. Like love doesn't mean romance anymore to me. It just means it's the foundation of romance to me. You know what I mean? Like you need that to go, okay, now that I love you, we have, there's a foundation for romance. Most people put it all in one thing. You know, like, oh, it's, but you know, it's like, yeah, but no, I gotta love you before I can romance you. And I gotta even, I have to like you before I love you. Like, I gotta just like you. <laughs> well, does that <laughs> you feel know? like more like the the word admiration would be more intact for that? Before no, 
No, admiration you can have for anything. You can have admiration for a guy, which I don't. But, <laughs> you know, but no, when I, love is, love is to me, it's, it's, it's like, it's like the foundation. It's like, it's like standing on the ground. Without the ground, we're going, you know, what do you have? Nothing. No, no gravity. Love is like gravity, you know? It's a foundation for life, you know? So romantic love is different from regular love. Now you got love and we're romantic about it. Now we're having sex, we're going on vacations, we're going to the movies, thinking about having kids, you know? And then marriage is like, well, let's make this whole thing legal. Let's, make, let's get the state involved in our relationship, which I don't ever want to do again. So, but I think it's just different, but I, I can write about it forever. You know, I can write about everything that people think they want, you know, and that. But for me personally, I'm, I'm too immature for most women my age to, to even consider <laughs> dating me. I would have to find somebody just as silly as ca and carefree as me to, 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 to wake up next to me and go, let's do something stupid today. But most women are sensible. You know, they want to do something sensible. Well, they, and well, in this age group, they want to feel that word security. And when you're carefree, security is not part of carefree. You know? Well, yeah, it, 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 yeah. It's and you're coming out with that. Let's do this or that. You know, they, they like that word security. You know, security, <laughs> security. <laughs> you can still be secure. You can still have some security. Um, it would be nice to be rich and carefree. Oh, but if you don't it. have, you're but if you rich. don't, if you don't have, if you're not rich, if you're just doing your thing and making money, you can still be carefree. Sure. Because what's the what's the point of waking up? You know, if you can't just. When I lived in Miami, right. I was hanging out with my ex-girlfriend, not gonna say her name, but um, I was just kind of hanging out with her. And we were walking on the beach, it was two o'clock in the afternoon. And I think I started to complain about something that I, <laughs> that I always like to complain about. And she goes, you need to be quiet. I said, what do you, do? What do you mean? She goes, look at you, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. And what are you it's doing? 80, right? She goes, it's 85 degrees outside. You, you're walking on a beach with a beautiful woman and we just had this great lunch and what, look at your life. Like, you don't have to answer to anybody. And I, I thought about it, I was like, damn, I feel like an asshole. Man. You know, it was just, it was a very surreal moment when she told me, I was like, you know what, you're right, you know? And I'm pretty sure half the people on the beach, on the same exact sand as me, that guy probably has a million bucks, bucks in the bank. And this guy probably owns all these properties, but we're doing the same exact thing at this moment. We're looking out into the water, we're enjoying the same day, the same air. You know, his air is not better than my air. His sand is not better than my sand. It's the same exact sand at that moment in time. So that's what I mean by being carefree. You don't care about nothing going on around you. It's just you and, and what's happening for you at the time. A and lot of people can't, yeah, a lot of people can't do that. No, they can't. And that's a hard thing for people to accept that mm -hmm. I, they can't they used to being structured a structural way of living is for a lot of you know not for everyone but for most people they like that structural feeling you like to be able to go with the wind basically well that's the reason that's literally the reason why i like the music industry because it allows me to wake up not at six in the morning but at whenever i want to wake up you know that to me is freedom i'd rather have freedom and less money than a lot of money and no freedom you know it just what's the point what's like I look at these doctors sometimes. It's like you, you've been on shift for like 48, 72 hours, but you missed your son's baseball game, you know? <laughs> so what's the point? You know, you got all this money, but you can't enjoy it. You can't enjoy your life. Because at the end of the day, I'm pretty sure on their deathbed, they're going to just think about the shit that, you know, the, little, the things that they thought mattered and it didn't, you know? So that's, I think that's what life's all. That's what I mean by carefree. Somebody just being free of care. Like, I don't care about all of you. I just care about people that I love and what, what's happening in my life right now. And me. And at that day, was right now, was the beach, the sand, you know, the water and this beautiful woman enjoying that moment, you know? So, and I'm silly and a little immature still. <laughs> I like being immature, dude. It keeps me young, you know? It just... It just keeps me a little giddy and you silly. You kind of have to be, to, in order to, you know, I always said when we're doing this music thing, to stay youthful, you have to be somewhat 
immature. You got to be stupid. Man. When I'm around my friends, silly laugh. You got to be because that's what life's about. You can't always be serious. And then this is not meant for you. This is not this mm -hmm. job is not the job that picked you is not meant for everyone. Mm -mm. I remember Paul really Simpson saying, "Was it the job I picked? It was a job that picked me." And it's true. Mm -hmm. It really is that because not many can say they made it in this game. It's weird. You know, I used to think when I was younger, I was so uh, I was so unsure of my gifts. I used to have, uh, but they, they got a word for it now. It's called, um, ah, I can't think of the word they got for it now. Oh, imposter syndrome. <laughs> but back then, I had imposter syndrome where I thought every time somebody gave me money for something that I did, that I got one over on them. Like, oh, I did it again. You know, <laughs> like, they bought it like hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> and it's like, no, you freaking idiot. You actually did a good job. And it's like, yeah, but I, I'm not good at this. Like, am I? It took me years to come to that realization. Like, oh, wait, I got good at this thing, you know? But for years, I had imposter syndrome. I was like, they bought it. I can't believe somebody gave me a check for that. And I, went to, I just sat at home and just played some notes and sang on some stuff. And But that's true. If everybody could weird. do that, if everybody could do that, what would make you special? Yeah, it was weird, dude. But it, I, you know, I think uh, imposter syndrome gets cured by when somebody you respect. I think you got to be validated by somebody that you respect. That's all. Yeah. Okay, you just got to be validated. Is it also the thing is, for a lot of us in the times that we all were in this game, beginning it it wasn't respected by people who went to regular jobs, you know? Oh no. Cause right. If you remember, if you said what you, what do you mean writing, producing, what do you mean song, right? They were like, yeah, you make money with that. Oh, well that's so, half my problem. That's half my problem with most women. Now I tell them what I do. Right. And they're and like, they go, mm -mm, you're, you're, you're a bum. You're a bum instantly. You're or they give me a look like, uh, like really? Like that's, you're still on that. I told I try not to tell people what I do, especially women, but when I have to. So what do you do? So if somebody asks you that you're not sure, what do you tell them? First they assume I'm a rapper. Like you're kind of old to be rapping. I'm like, no. <laughs> you're rapping. All right. Because they figure you're black, you say you rap, you're in the studio, you're a rapper. That's what they are. Or they just assume that you just you have nothing going on for yourself. And look, maybe half the time they're fucking right, but it's like my values aren't your values, you know? So you're kind of I don't know about anybody else, but I'm kind of stuck to people who actually like house music or know house music to date. If I'm going to date at all, it's, it's got to be in this box of people who actually gets it, you know? Got understanding, I, know what you yeah. did, knows your yeah, they, they, they kind of get it. I couldn't date, I couldn't date a banker. <laughs> and she'll be like, oh, so how much money did you make this year? And I was like, well, this amount. I was like, oh, well, I made more. And it's like, yeah, okay, that's nice, you know? Um, yeah, it's weird, dude. That's I don't really date. I just don't. It's weird. I, I just leave. I just kind of because of that reason. It's like I don't want to explain to you what I do for a living because it's too much of a headache. Yeah, you it's know. a lot of work. It's a lot of work trying to take, uh, make someone understand when they don't have no clue what what you're talking about. And I don't want to explain. Like the more you explain, the worse you sound. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Like this one girl, I told her um, what I did for a living. Cause I, she said, oh, I, I think I just got off a flight from some country. She said, oh, so what were you doing? I was like, I was working. I'm trying to say less as possible. And she's like, oh, so doing what do you what? do? What are you doing? And, I, and that's when I put my head in my hand, like I'm a DJ. And she's like, well, I said, I'm a DJ. And she was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And when they use that word interesting, it's not good. Oh, that's interesting. It's like, all right, yeah, well, that's what I do. Oh, it's like, so what kind of music? And it's like, house and techno you know i try to she goes oh okay so this is like a lot of young girls out there and this one they like you but they want to tear you down at the same time this is what they say Here we oh, go. so it's so, so a lot of young girls at the club or I, this is only after i show them some pictures like well this is me on the stage in brazil or whatever oh it's a lot of young girls out there so you like young girls and it's like wait a minute slow down i'm just saying like that's all around you i mean that's i mean i'm not knocking you that they say that I'm not knocking it, but you know, if you like young girls, it's like, oh my God. And this all came from what do you do for a living? Or let's say if they just say, um, not you like young girls, so 
I bet you have a lot of sex with a lot of women, don't you? They just throw themselves at you. And I said, I wish I actually lived the life that you think I'm living. I wouldn't be talking to you right now. I'd probably be out having an orgy with all these young, <laughs> weird <laughs> girls that you're talking about. So yeah, it's just it's just a weird thing to explain to people. So I just go, Ugh. I'd rather say I'm unemployed. I'm unemployed. I live in my mother's basement and I eat pork and beans out of a can for dinner every night. Now, can we have sex? <laughs> yeah. You know? And that's it. Oh. And that is it, Roland. You're good to go. You're good to go, Lenny. You're you you're you're married still, right? You're good to go. I'm married. Been you know my wife a long time. You remember her from years ago. You're, you're good to go, but you're I don't happy. know what else. I don't know. Like I told somebody else, I don't know any different anymore. It's just you know yeah. I'm, I'm in that different world. Definitely in a different world. You're happy. You look, you get to go upstairs, maybe to a meal. I gotta go upstairs and make a tuna fish sandwich and <laughs> oh damn the, the the bread is moldy. I gotta go to the store, but I'll just cut the mold off this little part. It should be fine. Maybe if I toast it a little bit and throw some cheese on there, I won't get sick. That's my life. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. And then maybe one o'clock in the morning, open the computer, look at the message, see who wrote to you, and maybe write a song or something happens, right? Oh Jesus. Right, like I said, I wish I lived the life people thought I lived. It's weird. But that's me complaining. I'll, dude, it's like it's weird. It's like uh you're either happy or you're not, or both. It's it's just, it's a weird thing. It's weird, dude. You I'll try this, to be on look, Roland. You hear people tell you I'm lonely and I hate being lonely. In other words, I'm alone and I hate being alone. Then you hear people tell you I'm married, I hate being married. What's the winning what's the winning factor for, for someone? What what is the win? Oh, it's it's you. It's always you. That's right. So I, by, by saying that, if you don't like being married, then don't stay married. If you don't like being uh, lonely, then don't be alone. And it sounds easier said than done, but my cure is to get up out the house and go someplace that I've never been before and be around people, even if I don't talk to them, that I've never been before. There's certain places now here that I go that I'm just, just being in a room full of people, you don't even have to talk to them. The energy of those people, they kind of rub off on you. Like you, you kind of like it, it gives you this 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 regeneration that, that you didn't have. It, this feeling of society, this feeling of um just being in a social setting gives you a feeling of being belonging to a society, period. Um most people are introverts and don't even know it. You know, they 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 want to be out and be social, but don't want to talk. That's me, right? That's called being an ambivert. There's a word for it. I, I Googled it. There's a word for it. So, you know, when I when I used to go out, people go, oh, he's so mean. I didn't think he was so nice, Roland, but I used to see you in the clubs, but you had this look on your face. Is it because I'm a I'm an ambivert? I want to be out, but I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that was me for a long time. But yeah, dude, that's where we are now. And let me tell you, everyone, this is a lot for him. Roland doesn't talk like this when we're together. He's more like jokes, oh, yeah. comes out of something that's oh, yeah. nowhere, quiet. Oh, yeah. I, this is like, I, I, I'm, I'm blessed I'll crack, to do this. I'll, I'll crack on your, your shirt in a minute. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's exactly. <laughs> and if he ain't cracking on you, something's wrong. Because he's got yeah. it. That's Roland Clark. Yep. On that note, Roland, we're going to say <laughs> good luck to your next ventures, wherever they take you. Mm hmm on the techno uh, world. I'm still doing house. Don't get it twisted now. I just added some no, stuff he ain't. to the uh, No, he ain't. Yeah, he ain't doing, doing house. house. He's I'm doing, doing house. Go, look, go to my social media, Roland Clark Music at IG. And where am I on Twitter? I'm on Twitter, I'm at Roland Clark. On Facebook, I'm at DJ Roland Clark. Instagram, I thought it was Roland Clark Music. Yeah, Roland Clark Music. My OnlyFans is, I forgot my OnlyFans. Anyway. <laughs> only um, page? I don't, I'm just joking. <laughs> I was say, wow. Whoa, he's got only fans. I was like, Man, he's really going in another direction now. That's funny. I wish you know. That's good though. You got me on that. I was like, I got, got you. <laughs> My only fans. Is... Only fans. I was like, what? No, nah, dude, that would not look. If I have to get an only fans page one day, you'd be like, oh, okay, that's it. Rolling, it's a wrap. Rolling, yeah, um, but yeah. My IG's Roland Clark Music, but check me out. 
Follow him, I'll, everybody. I'll, follow him. Follow me. I'll follow you back if you unless you're a guy. And um <laughs> that's the problem. If your guy ain't following you back, you woman. I'm not following you. Why am I following you back? I'm not interested in you. You don't have anything interesting to say. I'm just joking. I'll follow you back. Um yeah, that's it. All right. Rolling to the young kids. Any advice before I let's say goodbye to you? Um, who what who wants to be in the music industry? I would guess right, who would want to follow you doing this? <sighs> Jesus. No, no advice. <laughs> no advice note, whatsoever. Happy holidays, everyone. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Roland Clark, for the wonderful <laughs> advice. Remember, everyone, don't use the advice. Just follow your lead. Keep it going. <laughs> no, just be true to yourself. That's all. Just don't let anybody tell you you're worth. You know what I mean? If you feel like you're worth this, then that's what you're worth. If you, if you say you're well, this... And that's what you are. You, you know? know what? One thing I'm going to say that you did do right. You didn't listen to anybody in the beginning because you wouldn't be doing this anymore. Yeah. When you got turned down with certain projects and things, you, that's enough to turn anybody away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I knew my self-worth. I knew, I knew there was something. There. So regardless of how bad you felt, that's the advice right here. Regardless yeah. how bad you felt, you always said, no, nah, uh-uh. I'm worth more yeah. than this. Yeah, a feeling a feeling only lasts for a moment. Those moments go away. Then after that moment happens, then what? You still it's just just you now. Still. So feelings don't last, but you know, your your gift and your talent, that's embedded in you. That lasts forever. But you went to Clark Kent, Kent, for example, with that gut feeling and said, Do me a favor, play this before Timmy gets on. You just mm -hmm. had that gut feeling. If he played it, it would change, right? Changed my life. Life story became a hit record. I know that. You know. That's all I know. It's a hit record for me. And also, I know I forgot to ask you about because I've been dealing with her too. Chanel, One Man. You wrote that, right? That's the first song I ever wrote that came out uh, commercially was One Man. One Man, you let you down. Da, da, da. Yeah. Yeah. Chanel. That's my crush. Whew. Yeah. She, anyway. She's still beautiful even today. Yeah, still a beautiful person. Wonderful person. Yeah. Happy holidays, Mr. Roland Clark. Happy holidays, everybody. Don't leave us. We will see you next week. Same place, same bat time, same bat channel.